have won the victory. No, hallelujah. You have won it all for me. Said death could not hold you down. lift up some praise to God. I mean some unrestricted praise to God. Some praise that you don't care if somebody see you dance, somebody see you shout, somebody see you clap your hands. Just lift up a hallelujah, hallelujah.
rules, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Say no more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage, I am free, yeah. Say no more shackles, no more chains. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage, I am free. Let's let the devil in hell know that we are free. Come on, say no more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. music and then you heard the get down, get down. Um, I, I want to tell you something. I think it's wonderful to know that we got this kid, this many kids in college that's not ashamed of the Lord and they stand up. You know, just the, the power that the Apostle Paul had. And I was reading in Acts earlier this week how that he came in and preached till midnight. And I said, Lord, that's what I want you to do for me tonight. Give me the ability to stand up here and preach till midnight. Uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I wouldn't do that to you. Uh, let me, uh, we're going to look at... Uh, Luke chapter 5, or chapter 15, verses 3 through 7. And I'm going to take that and from that uh, talk about uh, our subject tonight. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. During World War II, uh, most of you know the name Winston Churchill, but during World War II, Winston Churchill said these words, and he said them with passion in his voice. Thanks to recordings, I've heard this speech. And he says, I have nothing to offer but blood, sweat, toil, and tears. You ask, what is our policy? I will say it is to wage war by sea, by land, by air, with all our might and with all the strength God can give us. He became a man with a single-minded purpose, a man with great passion, 
passion for freedom, passion for victory, a passion to see Hitler stopped, and a passion to see England saved and victory for England. Now there's an army today. An army that, that's around today has soldiers in it. We have a common enemy, but I'm not talking about the U.S. military service. There's a victory to be won, and I hope you're a part of this army, this great army. For this war to be won, there's some things that have to occur, but first off, we will need a passion to win. That is one of the things that gave the country of England the guts that they had during that war because their leader, with passion in his voice, inspired passion in other people's lives. And we've got a Savior who, if He's not inspired passion in our lives, then something's wrong. Where is that passion? That's what I want to talk about restoring tonight. The passion. God restore to us the passion that we had when we first came to you. And this war that we're in, it's a battle. And it's a battle for, for lost souls, the souls of mankind. A war where it's the good guys who go after the bad guy. Now notice what I, I, what I didn't say. I know, notice I didn't say where the good guys go after the bad guys. No, we go after the bad guy, Satan. Because it's Satan who doesn't want anyone to know about Jesus. These poor people who don't know about Jesus are not our enemy. They are the ones that we're fighting for. They are the ones that we want to be victorious with us. They're not our enemy. Satan is. And for this war to be won, we are going to have to have a great deal of passion. We're going to have to have this single-mindedness. This battle for lost souls requires it. Where's the battleground? It's wherever we are. Wherever you live, wherever you work, wherever you go, that's where the battleground is. It's inside our own homes. That's the battleground. It's to take the message of Jesus Christ outside this building and to take it wherever we go, to whomever we see, whenever we see them, and teach people that they can have eternal life with God the Father in heaven, and they can even have a life here on earth that is described as the abundant life, they can live more abundantly than they ever thought possible. But I really do fear that the church today is on the losing side of the battle because there's not enough passionate people. We don't show that passion anymore. You know, I say that because I have to be realistic. And if I'm going to be realistic, I'll say that. But... God teaches us, Scripture tells us that we can still turn the tide of this war. God has the power. God's power is never diminished. That power is available to us. We're asking Him through that revival, through this revival, to restore the power in us. So it's still available. It can still be done. It'll take an all-out war against the enemy. Two things I want you to consider tonight. Just two simple things. The first one is the priceless, priceless soul. Let's go all the way back to Genesis. If you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. The very breath of Almighty God is in each and every human being. Uh, that's amazing. God who created us, breathed into us eternality. We're all going to live forever somewhere. It's the choices that we make in this life that determine where we're going to live. But we will all live for eternity. John reminded us uh, in 1 John 5 the same thing. God has given us eternal life, he said. Well, that ought to tell us that there is value to a, to a soul. There is a priceless value to a human life. We are of value. We are important. We're important to God, not because of who we are, but because of who He is. Amen. And because of how He thinks of us and loves us. Let's move up a few millennia. And Jesus came from heaven to earth, leaving the glory and the splendor of heaven and all that was there. But He came to this earth because He knew that we were in deep, deep trouble. We were in a mess and we needed help. 
And that's where we still are today. We're in deep trouble, we're in a mess, we need help. And Jesus came to give us that help, and He's still doing it today. He says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. That's people. That's this priceless soul that I'm talking about. And Jesus gave His life on Calvary. Why? Because He understood the value of a soul. He understood the value of the person who lives down the street from you that you can't stand because they use a different kind of language, they got a different lifestyle than you do, and they're just not up to par in your eyes. Jesus said, no, that's a soul. That's a soul that I came for. You're fighting the wrong enemy. The enemy is not your neighbor. The enemy is Satan. Your neighbor has a priceless soul. That's Jesus' message to us. And sometimes I get so upset because we look at people or we, we look at the way they act and the things they do and we get so angry and sometimes people get disgusted with them. It's not them. Can't you see? It's Satan doing this to these people. And we need to fight the enemy and that's Satan. And Jesus wants us to tell as many as people as possible what his saving message is. Jesus gave an assignment to the apostles, the Great Commission. And then that Great Commission. He told them to go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he said, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, and I'll be with you always. And that promise is to us. And if you look through the New Testament, they went to extremes. They went to extremes to make sure that that message was carried on. They, made, they went to extremes to make sure that people heard the gospel. And they didn't care what it cost them. When Jesus gave the apostles this great commission, they realized that no trip was too far. They realized that no expense was too great. They also realized that no suffering was too immense. We don't suffer today because of Christianity. If it is, it's not the kind of suffering they did. And also, no sacrifice too deep. If it meant that one person, one God-created priceless soul, would turn his life or her life over to Jesus Christ, it was all worth it. The soul of every person in our world, in our neighborhood, in our workplace, in our city, in our state, in our country, is priceless. As long as you and I realize, like Jesus, like the apostles, like the early Christians, the value of a soul, as long as we never forget that, as long as we keep that at the forefront, then there is more than hope for the people out there. There's Jesus for us. And we have the message. I just think sometimes we forget the value of a soul. Lord, help us. Help us to see the value of a soul, the priceless value. And then secondly, Lord, help us to renew a single passion. A single passion. I don't know about you, but when we were young, at least males, we all wanted one of these knives, and these knives had four or five blades. They had a fork, they had a spoon, uh, they had a corkscrew, and they had a little pair of scissors in them. You know, the Swiss Army knives. Every male wanted one. As we got older, we realized, well, you know, uh, that knife's really not practical. If I want a knife, I'll buy a case or an old timer or, or, or something like that. And we learned that that fancy knife that we had was, was good to look at and it was fun to look at and play with. But it was so versatile, did so many things that it really wasn't of much value. It does a lot of things, that knife does. But you know what? doesn't do one of them well. You ever tried to cut with those little tiny scissors? Oh my goodness. It does a lot of things. But, when you buy the case or the old timer, just a knife, it does exactly what it was designed to do. Give me one man who says this one thing I do, 
rather than someone who says these 50 things I dabble at. Jesus was single-minded. Remember what he said in Luke 19, for the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. That was his purpose. That was his passion. Jesus was focused. He never lost sight of that purpose. Never. He never lost sight of that goal. That was the goal for him. That should be our goal. He knew why that he came and he had a passion for this purpose. Not only him, but if you look at the Apostle Paul's life, the Apostle Paul had the same passion within him. Driven seems to be the word that describes Paul. He was just such a driven man. He had this intense desire to win the loss. Could we have endured what he put up with? And quickly I want to read to you what he put up with in 2 Corinthians 11. Beginning in verse 23, he says, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in dangers in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. That was a lot of things, but let me read that last line to you. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern. His concern pressured him. That's why he went on to say in 1 Corinthians 19, he says, Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. He's compelled. He said, I couldn't stop if I wanted to. I'm compelled. There's pressure within me not to stop. Woe to me. Woe to me if I don't do this. There's, there's no other power. No other power as effective as the life of a man or a woman who sees their godly purpose. And after seeing that godly purpose... They get this single-minded passion that Jesus had, that the Apostle Paul had, and with a single-minded passion that is in them until it begins to burn. God restore that in us. I want to wrap up with three thoughts about Christians and evangelism. I believe it was Joe Aldrich who once shared this. He says, the further away a Christian is, from personal evangelism, the more they are involved in criticism and unhappiness in their church. I think he put it this way, when fishermen don't fish, they fight. And we're called to be fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I'll make you fishers of men. They left their nets and followed him. Secondly, too many Christians are no longer fishers of men, but just keepers of the aquarium. We've settled for that. We've become, we've become satisfied with that. Now let me say this. Discouragement will come in the lives of people who are involved in personal evangelism. That blessed discouragement of knowing you gave your very best to share the gospel with someone even though they declined. That's a blessed discouragement. And you will shed tears for those who have said no. But you'll know in your heart you gave it your all. I would have never experienced that type of disappointment. I hadn't attempted to lead people to Jesus. That's why I call it a blessed discouragement. And then thirdly, Christianity has failed when the only thing it does is take us to church on Sunday and not to the lost of our community. I don't mean you leave here tonight and go out and be a nuisance to everybody you see. That's not what I'm talking about. 
But as God gives us opportunities, and He does, ask God when you go to bed tonight, and especially when you get up in the morning, God, open my eyes today. May I see what I've never seen before. May I see with spiritual eyes the hurt on people's face, even though they don't show it maybe to anyone else. Lord, that I can see it in them, and I can hear it in their voice, and that I'll be there. And I'll be one to share the message. Open my eyes, Lord, that I can see, and He will. Give me opportunities, Lord, and He will. And He just began to share Jesus with all those people. What He's done for you, what He can do for them. Share with them that they have a family here at this church that will love them. They have a place to belong. Let them know what Jesus has done for you and so many others. So what's going to be our evangelistic policy here? It'd be nice if we could use those same words, I have nothing to offer but blood, sweat, toil, and tears. You ask what is our policy, and I'll say it is to wage war in our neighborhoods, in our streets, in our city, in our state, in our country, and around the world and with the strength that God will give us, we'll overcome. And we'll see victory. God bless you.